This is a short story collection by an amazing Kuwaiti writer, Shahada Shumari. Um, it's called Nights in the Flash, and the uh, the story that I'll be reading from today is called uh, System Shock. Right. I'll be just reading an excerpt from here, and I hope you're gonna want to read it. Uh, I think it's available on uh, Amazon. Um, it shouldn't be a problem for you to order it uh, and read it because um, it's, uh, it's really intense, you know. The stories here are quite real and uh, uh, most of it is about illness narrative, which uh, we don't have much. So, wow. Uh, I do think you should give it a try. All right, okay, let's uh, let's do this. My father left me at the hospital and said he would be back later in time for any tests they might be doing, any procedures they might perform. After he left, an Indian nurse explained to me that they would be needing to do a lumbar puncture, which is basically a test they do, where they stick a needle in your spine, extract some fluid, test it, and they find out whether you have multiple sclerosis or not. Uh, so far, the doctors were suspecting multiple sclerosis. At the time, I had no idea what that meant. It just sounded nasty. And the word multiple meant it was going to be double trouble and probably multiple disasters. The doctor who performed the lumbar puncture looked like David Beckham. He was stunning. He tried to make me as comfortable as possible, talking to me about all the places I should visit in London, the horrible weather, and where I was planning to study. I tried to talk to him, but I was too tense. I knew he would be sticking a needle in my spine, but I had no idea that it would hurt, especially because he did anesthetize the uh, area. I had my back to him, and I was curled up in a fetal position while he was busy making sure he didn't paralyze me. As the long needle entered what seemed to be the gaps in my spine, I realized that somebody was drying my tears. I was unaware that I was crying. There were tears I was not aware of running down my cheeks and they were big, manly, hairy hands hurrying to dry them, perhaps before I could notice them flooding my face and sob like a baby. I felt as though the world was ending. I sta stared at the empty space ahead of me, at the way the curtains seemed to dance in front of me, caught in a different world, a world free of pain. All I wanted to do was pass out, but there I was, still crying as the beautiful doctor probed my spine. When he was finished, I was told to rest and sleep as much as I could and that a fever might visit me at night. I thanked him for everything because you have to be polite and say thank you for hurting me because you're just doing your job and all. I fell asleep immediately after, dozing off into a different place, a place where I was haunted by horrible nightmares, the kind that requires conscious effort to wake up from. I woke up screaming halfway through the night. I looked around me and in the darkness I realized I was completely alone. A nurse rushed in. I have to take your BP, she said, pushing me down. My head hit the pillow and it felt like it could smash into pieces. So I lay there and let her do what she needed. I tried to stay awake. I checked my phone and realized that my father had called and messaged me apologizing for not being able to make it. My mother had also called me, so I slowly, grudgingly picked up the phone and pressed the redial button. Hi, Mama, I whispered, and then she started talking with that voice of hers, telling me that she raised a strong woman and weakness is never an option. Stay warm, stay in bed and keep checking for any fever symptoms. Drink lots of water, it helps wash out the toxins, my mother ordered. It took all the strength I had in me not to cry. I just kept saying, yes, I will, don't worry, and I love you too. Did it hurt? That was her final question. She had been avoiding it. Yes, but I'm okay now. I'm proud of you, she responded. 
That was the best way to end the conversation. We exchanged I love yous and good nights. I stared at the ceiling. It took me a few minutes to decide what to do. I think I had decided before I knew I had decided. I called my best friend. After six or seven times of calling Selma, her mother answered the phone. She told me that Selma was busy, but did I need anything? I just wanted to tell her that I'm in London, I'm at a hospital, they think I could be sick, something called multiple sclerosis. Oh, oh no, no, I'm sure that is not the truth. You don't look, you don't look a mess, Sarah. You really don't. Those are old people. We had a relative who was in a wheelchair. You are so young, dear. So Miss Mother assured me. I didn't feel reassured. Instead, I felt as though she had just accused me of lying, exaggerating. Like I wanted to be old in a wheelchair. Well, I spent the next hour fuming. Selma finally called back. Yes, how are you? I'm okay. Thanks for calling back. I've been trying to reach you. Yes, I've been told more than once. Well, it was uh, nearly impossible to get through to you. I'm sorry. So sorry. I'm, I just am sorry. I apologized frantically. Perhaps if I apologized, she would be kinder. What do you need, Sarah? Her tone was ice cold. It was as though she wanted to spit on me, but her manners and upbringings did not allow her to. What do I need? What do I need? Um, well, the thing is, I'm in London, but I'm at the hospital. I'm really sick. How sick? Her voice remained the same. Sick enough that I can barely walk? I can barely hold the phone and talk to you? I don't know how bad it is, but it's bad, and I think it's chronic. And it has something to do with my brain. And maybe it's brain cancer for all I know. And maybe it's something called multiple sclerosis. Which just sounds scarier if you ask me. And I don't know if I'm paralyzed forever. Or if I'm dying. But all I know is I'm scared. And I'm alone. And I miss you so much. And I love you so much. And I just want us to be okay again. And if you just tell me what I've done to deserve this treatment. I would understand and apologize. And it would be okay. Please Selma. I babbled. No silence, just silence. And my heavy breathing, or was it hers? I think I have nothing to say to that, except that bad things happen to bad people and you are evil, Sarah. Selma finally spit out. There, that was it. That was all there was to it. That was a definite large lump in my throat. I couldn't spit it out. I couldn't get rid of it. I was silent. Afraid my voice would crack. And that is all I have to say. But I do wish you all the best. And I have nothing against you. And I'm sure you will be fine. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? So my heat. No, no. Thank you for your time. I replied as formally as possible and as untruthfully as ever. And we hung up. But I never really got over it. I remained hung up for the next eight years. Her words haunted me and I asked myself, what was it that made me evil? Did I really deserve to be punished? I didn't hear from Selma until years later. She eventually called me, eight years later, to apologize. She had decided to become a nurse and she worked with them as patients all the time. She claimed throughout all these years that her guilt kept haunting her. It turned out that there was one boy, one boy, who used to go to our school, who had spotted her with her boyfriend. He had informed her brother of the crime he had seen and her family had decided to blame it on me to get her to confess. After all those years, it was simply because of some stranger's words that everything had fallen apart. Right. Uh, yeah, if you want to know more with this book. Bye.